Bibles this morning. By the way, Jesus does say he's still in the saving business, and Jesus will revive. And we're praying for that to happen here uh, in this place. But Hosea chapter 14. Find the book of Daniel. Next book you'll see there is Hosea. Hosea chapter 14. It's page 929 in the old Schofield, 929. But the title of my message this morning is Return Unto the Lord. You'll see that phrase right out of the scripture here in Hosea chapter 14, starting there at verse 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. It's Hosea chapter 14, now verse 3. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backslidden, or excuse me, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as a dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall, be, or shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Our Heavenly Father, I, I pray now that you'd give me strength and power to preach what you've laid in my heart. I pray that you would work in our lives, that we right now, this time, would just devote it to you, that you would capture our attention and our minds, that we would focus on you today and let you do a work in our hearts that we need. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We call Hosea one of the minor prophets, but I want to tell you this morning, the message is definitely not minor that Hosea has here for us, and nothing minor about this message at all. What a sweet message that we find in the book of Hosea, and so, you know, we read there in these, first, these seven verses of chapter 14, but this passage is speaking about a backslider. Now, here's the question, what is a backslider? What is a backslider? A backslider is a child of God who's gotten out of fellowship with God. A backslider is not a lost person. A backslider is a saved person. Why? Well, look, you know, God uh, 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 has saved an individual. You have to go somewhere before you, in order to slide back. And so you have to be saved in order to slide back uh, uh, from that. So a backslider is someone who is gone with God and, uh, and then has slidden back. He's a person who needs revival. That is a backslider. A person who needs to, as Hosea said here, needs to return uh, unto the Lord. So, so many times we call evangelistic crusades. We call them revival meetings. And that's not a revival meeting. Uh, evangelism and revival are two different things. Evangelism and revival, they're not the same at all. You can't revive a dead person. And evangelism is turning dead men to life. That's not revival. Um, and honestly, I would have to say I believe revival is more important than evangelism because if we have revival, evangelism will follow. It'll be a result of revival. And as, as we can't get the cart before the horse here. We cannot do the work of God if our hearts aren't right with God. And if we, if we haven't uh, have the revival, the power from God. So our first job is not primarily to spread the gospel. Our first job is to be worthy is to be able and empowered to spread the gospel. You remember in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus says, There ye shall be, or ye shall receive power 
After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. And so, uh, before our Lord said, go ye, he said, tarry ye. And that's what we want to do today, is just kind of take some time to look into our own hearts. And oh, I'll be honest with you, today my heart yearns and longs for it, dreams for it, prays for revival. Revival in my own heart. And I, I, I want, I, I'll be the first to say, I'm not arrived. I want more. I'm not satisfied. And folks, if there's one area where we can be a little greedy, where we can want more, it's in the area of the spiritual things. Want more of God. Want more in that relationship. And that's what revival will bring. I want to go deeper. I'm thankful that I can go deeper, and I am striving to go. I'm learning and growing, all every Christian ought to be. But I'll tell you, there's so much more that I want, and there's much more that I anticipate. And I'll tell you, this, this thing about being a Christian gets more and more exciting every day. You know, there's not a lot of been, uh, this past year, not a lot to get excited about. But if you're a Christian, there's every reason in the world, every day to be excited, to get up, to go out, because he is our motivation. He is our life. He is our heartbeat, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and I, I thank God for what he has done. I thank God for what he is doing, even in the life of our church now. I wish I could see the every pew filled this morning. I wish I could see every seat filled that there would be only standing room available. That's it. But, uh, but praise God, he's still at work. He can still do what he desires to do through our lives if we'll let him. Let's not allow fear to control us. I'm thankful for you being here. Sometimes a little bit of snow on the road. I don't know. I don't think we can go to church today. Oh, the temperature's cold. I, I was saying this morning, I don't ever remember us getting out of school because it was cold. But they're already talking about letting school out because of the cold weather. And um, But I will say this, um, kids today don't seem to know how to dress properly for the cold. We had a little girl ran out of the, to the van this morning in her socks and just running through the snow. And, and, and not just a little tiny sweater on. Uh, I said, oh, it's not cold. Yes, it's only 14 below wind chill. Not cold at all, is it? But anyway, my point is this. You didn't allow those things to keep you from God's house, and I'm thankful for that. And wouldn't it, God, that we'd have more uh, of people? Isn't it something that sometimes it's, well, it's just that we've allowed fear to keep us from doing what God would have us to do. We cannot do that. And I, I'll be honest, I, there's been a lot of things that's been put out in our uh, news and in society that is not true. And we cannot get our, uh, uh, have faith in what they're going to tell us. We have to have faith in God's word. Trust him. Take him at his word. <clears throat> so there's a lot God has done. And, but there's so much more that we need, that we ought to want for. And we cannot deny that God, what he has done, what he is doing. And he, uh, we, we cannot do anything less than be grateful and to praise his precious name. And, and oh, but how we need to get deeper with God, um, how we need to go further with God, how we need more and more of him. Now, let me ask you, do you need revival? Do you need revival? Do you, you don't need to answer that out loud, but do you need to return? Do, are you a backslider? Now, that's a hard one to answer out loud, isn't it? Are you a backslider? You say, well, I don't know, really, preacher. I, well, well, do you want to know? I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Whether you want to or not, I'll tell you. Uh, here it is. Uh, let me tell you how you can know whether or not you're a backslider. Now, are you ready? This is really deep. But if there was ever a time when you were closer to Jesus Christ than you are right now, you're a backslider. It's, it's that simple. And if there was ever a time when you were closer to the Lord than you are now, there was ever a time that you had a greater love for the Bible and you were more involved in the Word of God and that you had more prayer, it uh, was more powerful and you had more time in prayer and you're more faithful than you are right now, if that's the case, you're a backslider. A backslider. 
I'm not saying you're lost and going to hell. I'm just telling you that's what the, how the Bible defines it. Let's be honest with ourselves. If that is the case, we need revival. We need to return to the Lord. Now, as we look at this passage here in the book of Hosea, chapter 14, I want you to see three things we're going to look at. In fact, we won't see all three of them this morning. I'd already decided I've got a marked area where I'm going to park and uh, try to get to get a more reasonable time there. Um, Mildred keeps telling me I'm going way too long. But uh, so if she's saying that, I'm sure others are too as well. But why return? Why should I return? Why do I want to return? In verses 1 through 2, again, uh, we are told to return to the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. But why? Well, what causes backsliding? One little word, sin. That's what causes backsliding. What causes us to fall away from God? It's very simple. It is sin. Now, if you would turn back to the first chapter of the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 1, and here Hosea gives us a graphic illustration of what backsliding is and what it's like. Hosea, he fell in love with a young lady, and her name was Gomer. And as a matter of fact, she was chosen by God for uh, Hosea. And the Bible tells us uh, uh, about this in chapter 1 and verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go, take him to be a wife. Now look at this. A wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. My, that's pretty rough to see here. It sounds like God is telling Hosea to marry a harlot. To marry a fallen woman. But uh, I, I want to tell you, I, I believe it, she's not this way at this time. Um, she's at this time, but she's not in that state of, uh, of behavior. This is what God foresees would happen. And this is the reason that God uh, gives us uh, uh, the description of, of Gomer here. But God would not, I, I do not believe that God would have any of us marry such a person. And, and that's my view. Um, but God knew what was going to happen. So he tells the story uh, before it ever gets started here. And, um, but Hosea fell in love with, obviously, a beautiful young woman whose name was Gomer. And they, they had, uh, for a while, I suppose, they had a very wonderful and happy life. Well, we know they had three children. They, uh, they were born to this home. The nursery soon was filled with these uh, the noises of three little children, and, and there were, uh, uh, but, but then one day, Ho, Ho, our, our Hosea, he comes home, and he finds a note pinned on the pillow, and, and his three children in the nursery, and his wife, nowhere to be found. And this is what the, the note said, in effect. Look at verse, um, or chapter 2, if you would, and verse 5. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers. She had been flirting with some other men. She had become unfaithful to her husband. She had be, become an adulteress, and now she's gone after her lovers. And Hosea is left there with the children all by himself. Boy, that, that has happened many times over in our society. Gomer's wife starts the downward trail here. At first, she's living high. She's having a grand old time. She's going from one party to the next. And, 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 but after a while, she becomes soiled. She becomes degraded. She becomes a dirty plaything for dirtier men. Down, down, down goes Gomer till finally no one wants her anymore. And she becomes a streetwalker, a harlot. She has no pride. She, and, and, and after a while, she gets more and more wretched, more and more vile and diseased until she, just, she becomes a cast off, a person, just a piece of humanity. And she ends up selling herself into slavery. And she becomes a slave on the slave block. Now, this is what God tells Hosea. All this, is, it's awful what's happened here. His wife has left him, left the children. She's gone and living a wicked, ungodly lifestyle. 
And then God comes to, to uh, Hosea and he says, Hosea, I want you to go find Gomer. Go find her. I want you to buy her back. I, I want you to take her back to, to be your wife. I want you to restore her into your, your family. Now, look with me at verses in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. And you'll see here, uh, Hosea, how he responds to this. In chapter 2, and verse 14 and 15. And therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Now, this, he's speaking about Gomer, his wife that, that, uh, left him, that abused him by uh, uh, just for forgetting about her vows to him. Her children left, all, did all of these things. Yes, said, I will speak comfortably unto her and I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Amazing. What we see in the life of Hosea is a great picture here of the love of God. But that is what we see, a seeking love. Hosea, go find her. Hosea is now going out to seek. It's a seeking love. We can hardly believe it, but that's exactly what Hosea did. Now notice what he says here in these verses. He says, I'm going after her. I'm going to seek her. I'm going to court her. Can you imagine a man courting a wife who, is, who has been this vile to him, who's been that unfaithful to him, who has fallen so low in society? That's what he did. But not only is there a seeking love that we see in Hosea, we also see a sanctifying love. Look at verse 19 in chapter 2 here. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in the righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. He takes this woman and he tells her, I'm going to betroth you. Now, this word betroth, it means to woo a person as a virgin. Wait a minute. That doesn't fit this woman. But that's what Hosea is doing. A sanctifying love. He put all of her sin. He put all of her vileness and all of her filthiness. He puts it behind and says, I, we're not going to forget about that. We're, we're not going to allow that to hang over your head. Not only does he seek her, but he sanctifies her. He, he sets her apart as, a, as pure and clean. And not only was it seeking love, a sanctifying love, but number three, it was a sacrificial love. Uh, look in chapter 3 and verse 1. Hosea 3, 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love uh, uh, flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for uh, 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. He went down to the slave block, right down to the slave market, and he bought his wife back. What a, a, what a picture here of love, sacrificial love. Now, this is a strange price. Did you notice a strange price that he paid for her? Uh, the Bible says he paid 15 pieces of silver, a homer of barley, and a half homer of barley. Now, um, you know, so what, what's the meaning to that price? I, I do not believe they had a, a you know, banner out there saying, okay, this slave is going for this price. This is the going price. And they list all this silver and barley. No. Uh, some say, well, that, that's just the price. I, I, well, that may have been the case. But as I read it, it seems to me that Hosea, as he comes, he's just scraping everything he can find. He, he's just scraping all together, everything he has. I mean, he, he says, well, this, this is it. This is all I've got. Uh, let's see, I, I, I've got some silver over here. I've got a little bit of barley. I, I, I've also, I've got another half a homer of barley. Here it is. I give it all uh, for her. And I, I, everything I've got. And so whatever it was, it was definitely a sacrificial love that uh, we see in Hosea, sacrificial love. And then God said to Hosea, 
Now, Hosea, the love that you have, and there in, in chapter 3, uh, the verses I just read, it's basically what God is telling Hosea, the love that you have for Gomer is going to be a picture of the love that I have for Israel, for the people of Israel. You see, God, according to the Old Testament, God is married to Israel. Israel is the wife of Jehovah. But Israel, like Gomer, had turned away from God. And if she went away, she went astray, she sought after other gods and other lovers. And Israel committed spiritual adultery against the Lord. And this is God's way of saying to Israel, in spite of what you've done, I love you with a seeking love. I love you with a sanctifying love. I love you with a sacrificial love. I'm willing to go to any length to pay any price to bring you back to me. And that's exactly what God did. Not only for Israel, but for all of us. And that, but first of all, that is the application made here for Israel. And one day God will bring his wife back. And one day he, he's going to redeem the nation of Israel. And that's a matter of prophecy. And listen, it cannot fail to happen. It's going to happen just as God has prophesied it would. And we look forward to that time when Jehovah God will again enfold his arms, his, his arms around his bride, uh, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. The one who had treated him so faithlessly will return to him. But when you look at a passage of scripture, really, we need to look at it in several different ways. And I would encourage you to do this as you're reading the word of God. We have to look at it and ask ourselves, well, what did, what did it mean then in the context? What did it mean back then at that time? And then we have to ask ourselves another question. What does it mean now? You see, the Bible is not a dead book. The Bible is not only relevant for 2,000 years ago, it's relevant right here, right now in 2021 as much as it ever was. But it's good to ask ourselves, what did it mean then? What does it mean now? And then we have to ask ourselves this. What does it mean to me personally? Now, I know the primary application here is to Israel. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. It's to Israel. But I also believe there's a secondary application to America. And I, I believe just as God would have welcomed Israel back, God will welcome America back if we repent. God loves America like he loves Israel. God, oh, oh we, we're, we're not Israel, the Israel of God. In no way am I saying that. America and Israel are two different nations, two different people. But this shows us something about the great love of our God. It shows us the great compassion of our God. And it illustrates, as well as anything I know, the love of God. And I believe there's a, a secondary application here for America. America has forsaken God overall. America has turned its back on God. Is there any hope for America? If she will repent, just like the nation of Israel. And, and I, I, but I believe there's a secondary application also here for homes that are broken. I believe that just as Hosea was given a love for his wife that wasn't natural, a love that she did not deserve. There's not a one of us that said, you know what, I think she was really worthy of his love. No, we're all thinking, man, that guy must have been something to be able to go and after he had been treated in such a horrible way to go and just give her everything and love her. She didn't deserve. But God can give to you a love for your spouse that they may not deserve. I, I believe it's a supernatural love that comes from God. I know we are, I, I'm telling you, our society has become so immoral and so perverse in its way of thinking. Children today, I couldn't even, it just still boggles my mind what they think is okay. And it's ungodly, it's wicked. And um, 
But we, uh, we have to let them know that they can come back to God, that God can give us some love for those individuals that may have wronged us, that may have uh, uh, done some awful things to us. It's not natural for that kind of love, but God can give it to us. God can heal a broken home. God, God can, can heal our land, as he tells us also. But you see, the love that Hosea had for Gomer, it was a, a supernatural love. It was, a, it was God's love in him. Uh, it's not natural. It's not normal. I, I, I want to uh, uh, forgive and restore someone like that is not a natural thing. But that's what God can do. You see, we want our way, and we oftentimes allow our pride to keep us from doing what we need to do, what God wants us to do, to humble ourselves. Even if we were right, to humble ourselves and to love that person. Now, I believe there's another application here, and it's not to, to the life of, of every uh, or, you know, in fact, it is to every backslider. Every backslider, if you're backslidden here today, every Christian, whomever, I mean, wherever that person may be, the New Testament says to Christians who are backslidden, listen to this, and I'll just read it quickly. James chapter 4 and verse 4, James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? And when we go after this world, which is like a lover, as uh, we see in the, in the book of Hosea, like a vile harlot that would draw our love away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, so that's, that's just what we see here and uh, that the Christian is doing when we uh, go after the world. We're uh, committing the same crime here before God. Now, the second thing I want you to notice um, and, and we're going to park here because I'm pretty much out of time, but not only why we should return, I, I want you to notice how we should return. And I probably will hit on this tonight, but how do we return? Uh, go with me back and we'll finish right here in Hosea chapter 14 and with verses 2 and 3. Take with you words. And turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Asher shall not save us. Uh, we will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. So here in chapter 14, why return? Well, because we've gone away from him. We have sinned. Uh, um, and, and we need him. Like Gomer went away from Hosea, we have gone away from our Lord, and we need, we must return to him. No one can be a better judge of where we are spiritually than ourselves. You, you can fool, and we can fool everybody on this earth, but you and I will never fool God. Where are you spiritually? You see, when, when, uh, when he says here in verse 2, take with you words, what he simply means there, I believe, is just pray. Pray. Come to God with words of intercession. Come to God with words of confession. Come to God with words of prayer. Prayer. How are we to return? We must return with confession. You see that in verse 2. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. And take away all iniquity. So uh, that, that phrase there, uh, we, we are, we're to return to God saying, take away all iniquity. Have you ever asked God to do that? Have you ever asked God to cleanse you and to make you pure? Uh, have you confessed your sin, your iniquity before him? There's only one thing holding back the mighty hand of God in revival. And folks, it's the sin of the saints. 
It's the sins, I should say, plural, the sins of the saints. That's what's holding God back. We can point our finger at everybody else in society and say, ah, they're wicked, they're perverse, they are doing this and that, and that's why our society is like it is. That's why I am like I am. But that's not true. The only thing that's holding back the power of God, the only thing that's holding back the revival in our lives is our own sin. Our own sin. Have you ever asked God? Have you ever confessed <laughs> your iniquity, your sins before him? And there's only one way to deal with the sins of the saints, and that is that word, confession. If we confess, as it says in 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Now, I try to come with, and confess my sins. I hope I can say I have no unconfessed sin in my life, but I, I don't want to willingly sin, knowingly sin, deliberately sin. Uh, how foolish it is for you and I, Christian, to harbor sin in our lives. To think, you know, I'm going to hide it. I want to hold it. But God knows all about it. It's like, you talk about living in a glass house. Christians, we are, in the eyes of God, there's nothing hidden from him. And he sees it all. How foolish it is for us to harbor sin. To harbor something, you know, how foolish would it be for us to take in uh, a fellow that comes knocking on our door, he's got chains on his wrist, he's uh, got the orange jumpsuit, and he says, can I use your phone? <laughs> Why, sure. Well, in fact, we're just getting ready to sit down to eat supper. Why don't you have supper with us? Oh, you want to use my gun? Oh, sure. How foolish would that be to get allow a criminal, a, a, obviously, an escaped convict to come into our home and to do as he wishes? How foolish it is for you and I, Christian, to open the door to the devil and, say, and allow sin to come to our lives and say, you know, it's okay. It's fine. No, that is what keeps us from coming, from returning to God. And so, but no one, uh, not, not only must there be a prayer of confession in verse two, as we see, there also must be a prayer of consecration. Also in verse two, look what it says. Uh, we must return with consecration, not only confession. Um, not only should we say, take away all iniquity, but we say, receive us graciously. Receive us, Lord. Just as Gomer said to Hosea, Hosea, receive me. Yeah, Gomer wasn't able to say, you know, Hosea, I'm pure. I, I've done right by you. Hosea, our, our Gomer was guilty, was wicked, was vile. No one wanted her. And she says to Hosea, receive me. And just as Hosea said to Gomer, Gomer, I receive you. But you can't, and this is, you know, we see this in this passage here. He tells Gomer, you can't do this anymore. You can't run around like this anymore. You can't play the harlot anymore. Gomer, when you come back home, you're going to have to be true. You're going to have to be faithful. That's what God is saying to you and I this morning. Hi. I don't, boy, it's hard to picture, isn't it? A man who comes home and finds, and I know I put that in there, but uh, finds a note basically from his wife saying, you know what, I followed after my lovers. I don't want the kids anymore. I don't want you anymore. And then to get to the place where she's now a slave, and Hosea says, you know, I'm willing to give it all, everything I have to buy her back because I love her. That's what God, that's a great picture of what God is doing for you and I. He loves us so much, he wants us to be revived. He wants us to have that peace, that joy, that relationship. But will we say, like Omar was willing to say, Lord, receive me, I want to return. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord willing, we'll pick this thought back up here in the book of Hosea tonight. I knew it's just too much to get here in one service.
But folks, revival is what we need. Revive me. Let, let's not try to play games with God. Remember, you are in a glass house. God sees all, knows all. Are you backslidden? Do you need revival? You're aware of that if it's true. I think all of us, in a degree, we ought to want more from God today. Father, have your way here this morning. It's hard for me to even comprehend what Hosea went through. What, what an amazing picture of loving someone who is so unworthy, but that is until we see your love. You love us who are so unworthy, so undeserving. And I pray that today we would be willing to return. You have your way in this invitation. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.